Okay, so uh, I'm Steve Higgins, and um, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the April uh, lecture in the Vermont Center on Behavior and Health monthly lecture series. And we're in for a treat today, as you see there on the slide, um, Sandra Comer is our speaker today, and she's going to be talking about the pharmacology of Trent, uh, fentanyl, which is certainly um, a very timely and important topic. So um, Sandy is a longtime friend and colleague of mine, so it's really a pleasure to get a chance to introduce her. Uh, she's a professor of neurobiology in the Department of Psychiatry at Columbia University. Um, she is a uh, internationally recognized expert in the um, behavioral and neuropharmacology of opioids and other addictive substances. Um, she's as you might expect, um, received awards, national awards for, uh, that go along with that. She's been the um, president of the College on Problems of Drug Dependence, uh, one of the most um, widely recognized uh, institutions or um, colleges on um, the study of addiction. Um, she has a, an outstanding um, academic pedigree. It's always fun for me to look at somebody's CV who I know well, but I, I always forget different parts. But uh, Sandy began her education at Vanderbilt, where she was a psychology major, but also a chemistry minor. Uh, so I, I think she, she knew where she was heading already. Um, from there, she went to the University of Michigan, uh, where she took her PhD in um, psychobiology with a really famous um, opioid pharmacologist, Jim Woods, and um, did outstanding studies already at, at that point. From there to the University of uh, Minnesota, where she did her postdoctoral work with Marilyn Carroll. And at that time, um, the early 1990s, that was a hotbed. It still is a, an institution that's very well known for its work in this area of addictions. Um, and then finishing her uh, postdoctoral fellowship, um, Sandy was recruited to join the faculty at Columbia by Marion Fishman, I believe. That's at least how I recall it, um, yep. who with Herb Kleber was starting a center mm -hmm. on addictions there that is still thriving today um, with uh, Meg Haney and Richard Fulton and Suzette Evans and Net Nunes. They are really an outstanding group. And um, so, so we're in for a treat and, and I have to share that the way I, I think about Sandy and it's been true since her um, early work as, as a graduate student and a postdoc is she just represents like this combination of brilliance and grace that I, I'm always impressed with and I'm sure you're going to see it today. So Sandy, the floor is yours. Thanks for being with us. Oh, you're welcome, Steve, and <clears throat> thank you so much for that really nice introduction. And I just want to start my talk by congratulating Steve for uh, winning the Eddie Award at CPDD. That's the uh, the biggest award that the organization, <clears throat> you know, bestows on people, and it's just a testament to the excellence of his research. So, um, so, and I and I'd like to thank you all for. Um, attending this lecture and for inviting me here to, to give it. <clears throat> this is something that, you know, is very, very close to my heart in terms of, you know, science. Uh, I was very chagrined to hear, you know, to learn initially many years ago that fentanyl has, was uh, starting to become a problem. And <clears throat> because I knew the pharmacology of fentanyl for my graduate work. So, let me just get started with my slides. <clears throat> so these are my disclosures. I um, do some consulting work for various companies and do a lot of medications development work, uh, primarily in the area of opioid use disorder. So this is what I'll be talking to you about today. Um, <clears throat> I'll spend a little time in the beginning talking about the public health impact of fentanyl. Um, spend the majority of the talk, talk uh, describing the pharmacology of fentanyl. And um, my background is in uh, preclinical research, as Steve uh, described. 
But <clears throat> when I went to Columbia, I started doing um, clinical research in this area. So I have, you know, some uh, an interesting background, I guess, in in uh, you know, in in both areas. And I think it it's really helpful in in terms of trying to understand what's going on right now. And then <clears throat> I'll describe some potential solutions, um, maybe more questions that are raised um, than, than concrete solutions right now. So we know that fentanyl is a, is a potent synthetic opioid. Um, <clears throat> it was approved by the FDA in the 1960s as a general anesthetic. And it's really the mainstay of um, anesthesia even today. It also comes in other formulations that um, can be used to manage either chronic or breakthrough pain. But it's really not the pharmaceutical fentanyl that's driving the crisis now. So <clears throat> it's really illicitly manufactured fentanyl. Um, and the reason for this is that uh, the you can easily manufacture fentanyl from this substance um, phenethyl for Pipper down here. <clears throat> and in a couple of easy steps, you know, uh, make fentanyl um, or carfentanyl, which is even more potent. So <clears throat> the, there's a large profit margin for uh, drug dealers. It's easy to synthesize. And because it's so potent, it's easy to transport. So you've probably seen graphs similar to this in other talks, but I just wanted to kind of show it to you again um, <clears throat> to, to describe the trend that's happened over the past couple of decades. Um, <clears throat> so first we started with um, prescription opioids that kind of started to plateau at around 2010. And around that time, um, heroin started to increase and now that's starting to taper off. Then starting at around 2013, um, you know, we started getting reports of illicit fentanyl um, in the illicit opioid supply, and that has only increased uh, exponentially over the last several years. And then now most recently, um, this increase has in drug-related overdose deaths, sorry, I should have mentioned that first, um, <clears throat> has become attributed to stimulants. So, in the period ending November of 2021, which is the latest data that we have from the CDC, there were over 100,000 drug-related deaths. And the large majority of those, around 87%, are due to synthetic opioids like fentanyl. And com combining <clears throat> just the over overdose crisis that we're experiencing now um, is the, the COVID pandemic. So synthetic opioids were the um, you know, largest increase in overdose deaths um, during this pandemic. So the question is, why are these fentanyls driving the rates of fatal overdoses? One reason is that they're very potent, as I mentioned earlier. <clears throat> so estimates in, in um, you know, uh, preclinical and some clinical settings suggest that fentanyl is about 100 times more potent than morphine or 50 times more potent than fentanyl. So I think one of the reasons that we're seeing such a, a big um, problem with this is that it's really hard for a drug dealer to titrate the amount of fentanyl um, that they're selling to be one that, you know, a user would get high on versus one that will cause a fatal overdose. I want to spend some time talking about this paper, which I thought was really interesting. It was published last year, um, describing the um, unusual pharmacology of fentanyl. <clears throat> but before I get into that, I want to um, describe a few concepts that I think um, you know we should uh, discuss just so that we are all on the same page, basically. So potency is a concept that um, is related to the amount of drug that is needed to produce a given level of effect. So if we think of a 50% response, doesn't matter what it is, analgesia, respiratory depression, whatever. So, you know, we just look at one response and then it, um, for these four different drugs that we have as examples here, 
the one in green um, drug D is the least potent because it takes a lot of drug in order to produce that same level of response. So this could be something like morphine and then the most potent, which is the uh, drug A, takes a lot um, less of drug in order to produce that same level of response. So this could be something like fentanyl. Efficacy is another important concept that I wanna talk about. And <clears throat> this is basically at the same uh, EC50 or the affinity of the drug for the receptor, <clears throat> you can get different levels of response. So whereas potency is really describing the milligram amounts that are needed to produce a given level of effect, efficacy is really related to the concept of how effective that drug is at, at turning on the receptor basically. So at this same um, EC50, these three different drugs produce different levels of effect. So drug A would be a highly efficacious drug, B is kind of intermediate, and C is a low efficacy substance. Then <clears throat> the other concept is affinity. So this is really um, the ability of a drug to get to and bind to the receptor. So <clears throat> it's... Um, it's really uh, characterized by KD, which is the dissociation constant. So it's the rate of offset of the drug um, at the receptor site over the rate of onset. So <clears throat> this is just basically the ability of a drug to get to the receptor. So to contrast affinity and efficacy, so affinity is, is the ability of a drug to get to the receptor rate um, and efficacy is how much you can turn it on. So um, you can have a drug that has equal affinity for the receptor, so drug A and drug B, um, but one will turn it on. So it binds to the receptor and it produces a response, but drug B could be an antagonist same affinity, but it, and it also binds to the receptor, but no response is produced. So <clears throat> just wanted to kind of set those up uh, for now. So in this Kelly paper that I was describing, they did a bunch of binding studies to assess the affinity of fentanyl compared to morphine. Um, so morphine is sort of their standard comparison drug. And what they found from all of these studies is that the affinity of fentanyl and morphine are um, pretty similar um, across a bunch of different assays using different, you know, tissues, rats, guinea pigs, human tissues. Um, and the, um, oops, sorry. So, in terms of potency using these binding type assays, um, they found that uh, fentanyl was either similar in potency to morphine or only about you know, 14 times more potent. So, um, and <clears throat> the effic efficacy in these assays is similar as well. So this is in in vitro type studies. And I'm gonna show you some data using in vivo models that kind of call into question this conclusion that they have here. But in the paper, they also were describing some of these really interesting, um, to me anyway, <laughs> interesting uh, characteristics of fentanyl. So this is a, a diagram of <clears throat> the binding pocket in the mu opioid receptor. And fentanyl has multiple configurations that um, it can take to bind within that pocket and, and activate the receptor. So this is a bit unusual because morphine has a single um, configuration that allows it to turn the receptor on. So that's one you know, potentially important difference between fentanyl and morphine. <clears throat> Another important difference is um, the way that fentanyl gets to the receptor. Right, so, and this has to do with affinity we were describing before. So fentanyl is a very lipophilic compound. So this is the lipid bilayer, and this is the, um, the seven transmembrane domain of the mu opioid receptor. And fentanyl can, you know, because it's lipophilic, it can travel through this lipid bilayer 
make its way through the receptor um, and get to the pocket, right? Morphine on the other hand down here um, is not as lipophilic as, as fentanyl. And so the only way that it really gets to the, the um, binding pocket is you know, through the top basically. Um, and then it produces its effects. Fentanyl does this too. Um, so it has two methods of getting to the binding pocket, whereas morphine only has one. So that's maybe another important difference. <clears throat> another um, concept that they described in their paper was cross tolerance. So um, <clears throat> in morphine dependent animals, um, cross tolerance is uh, greater to morphine than it is to fentanyl. And I'll show you some data to describe what I mean by that in just a minute. So, you know, you can make animals dependent on morphine. They produce this kind of, you know, um, cross tolerance. This is actually the way methadone works. Um, you know, a, a patient will take different doses of methadone and by the mechanism of cross tolerance, they would not be able to feel the effects of something like heroin, for example. Fentanyl, in contrast to morphine or methadone, does not produce tolerances readily. And this partly has to do with its short duration of action. So a few years ago, um, I wrote, I wrote a, a review paper with Kathy Kale, where we were describing some of these differences in the pharmacology of morphine versus fentanyl. And um, in terms of signaling, we know that fentanyl has um, greater activity at the beta arrestin site on the mu opioid receptor, whereas morphine has greater activity at the G protein site. And this is important because the beta arrestin site is thought to mediate some of the aversive effects of, or the negative effects of opioids like respiratory depression. Um, the, the bigger, um, you know, uh, conclusions that we have from, from our uh, evaluation of the literature is that um, that pertains to clinical um, outcomes is, is the bottom three. So, you know, uh, as I described, fentanyl is more potent than morphine um, <clears throat> using in vivo models. It's more lip lipophilic and probably for the reasons that I was just describing, it has a rapid, uh, more rapid uh, entry into the brain. So luckily for us and our patients, um, there are multiple FDA approved medications for treating opioid use disorder. So we all know the maintenance medications include methadone, which is a full mu agonist, buprenorphine, which is a partial agonist, and naltrexone, which is an antagonist. And then we have um, two overdose reversal agents, including naloxone and nalmethine. So I want to focus first on naltrexone. <clears throat> so this was a study that I conducted while I was in graduate school, and I never thought I would be going back to it, you know, 30 years later um, to describe the results. So this was a study that uh, I conducted in mice using uh, a warm water tail withdrawal procedure to measure the analgesic effects of morphine and fentanyl. And basically what uh, it involves is that, you know, placing the mouse's tail into warm water and measuring the latency to them flicking the tail out of the water. So <clears throat> we tested morphine versus fentanyl and naltrexone versus this new um, compound called CCAM or Clocinamox, which is an irreversible antagonist. So what we showed was that both morphine and fentanyl in this assay under these conditions produces a full analgesic response. Um, when we gave a pretreatment dose of, you know, increasing doses of naltrexone, we got these, you know, orderly rightward shifts in the dose response curve for both uh, morphine and fentanyl. And I calculated a PA2 value, which is basically the potency of naltrexone in blocking this effect. And they're the same for morphine and fentanyl. So when given prior to the agonist, naltrexone has this um, pattern of effects. But when we pre-treated the animals um, with this 
irreversible antagonist. I'll just draw your attention to these, um, this dose. So it's 0.32 milligrams of CCAM here. It's producing this downward shift in the dose response curve for morphine, but fentanyl can still produce a full analgesic response. So a higher dose of the, um, <clears throat> the antagonist is needed to produce this downward shift in the dose response curve. So this is 10 and 32 milligrams of CCAM. So basically what this is telling us is that um, fentanyl is, requires fewer receptors in order to produce this full response. And these are more recent data that were collected by Charles France and his group. This is um, Toby McGuire um, showing uh, self-administration of fentanyl versus cocaine in, um, in rhesus monkeys. <clears throat> and he, the top panels show uh, a single administration of AMCAM, which is kind of similar to the CCAM that I tested. Um, showing that he produced, you know, you can produce this antagonism that recovers over days. With the higher dose of CCAM as an acute injection, um, the effect lasts a lot longer. So it lasts for about two weeks. When they gave repeated doses of this dose of CCAM, they got, uh, you know, long lasting suppression of fentanyl self administration, but not cocaine self administration. So this was really, uh, really nice data and very encouraging. So <clears throat> the antagonist is, is important in terms of, you know, whether or not you have a competitive or non-competitive interaction. I wanted to show you some data with um, another uh, fentanyl uh, analog. So carfentanil is much more potent than fentanyl. And this is in a um, drug discrimination assay. So I won't go into the details of what that is, but basically the, um, all three of these substances, um, heroin, fentanyl, and carfentanil completely substitute for the, um, the, the training drugs. So they're, they're producing similar types of effects. When they um, looked at the time course of <clears throat> fentanyl and carfentanil, you can see that it's very, fentanyl is very short acting. So within about an hour, um, the effects of fentanyl are gone. Carfentanil is much longer lasting. So this is very um, consistent with, our, with what our drug users tell us. They, they describe fentanyl as not having very good legs, basically, so, because it's sh so short acting. And what we're um, hearing a lot in, the, you know, in our lab is that um, people are reporting that they're using a lot more fentanyl um, in terms of the, the number of injections that they take per day and the number of bags that they use. So um, prior to fentanyl availability, you know, people were generally reporting that they were using five to six bags a day of heroin. And now it's not uncommon for people to tell us that they're using 20, 30, even up to 50 bags a day of, you know, a combination typically of heroin and fentanyl. So that obviously has implications for um, transmission of communicable diseases and all kinds of other issues. <clears throat> so in the same assay um, that uh, Sean Flynn and, and Charles France um, uh, described, they, they looked at the ability of naltrexone to produce rightward shifts in the dose response curve. So this is the same dose of naltrexone that they're giving under all of these conditions. And what they are showing is that naltrexone is producing about the same level of antagonism of fentanyl and heroin, <clears throat> but not very much against carfentanil. So the agonist is important too, you know, when you compare fentanyl versus one of the analogs and carfentanil is one of the scarier ones that I think um, is available there because it's, it's just so incredibly imp uh, potent. So those data that I showed you um, were primarily, um, you know, uh, pre-treatment pre studies where we gave the antagonist before the agonist, but what happens if you give naloxone to try to reverse 
in overdose. This is um, some data that were published in that Kelly paper that I was describing earlier. So up here is um, a dose of, uh, so let me just orient you to the figure a little bit. So <clears throat> black, um, black line is with saline administration. This is measuring minute volume, which is a measure of respiration. <clears throat> they gave the, um, the drug here, either saline, morphine, or fentanyl. Morphine is in blue, fentanyl is in red. <clears throat> and then they gave the naloxone, you know, after the respiratory suppression was, was pretty profound. And with 0.3 milligrams of naloxone, um, there was a complete reversal of morphine-induced respiratory um, suppression, but very little um, reversal of fentanyl-induced respiratory suppression. Same with one milligram, a um, little bit greater reversal of fentanyl, but still not back to saline levels. It took a tenfold higher dose of naloxone to produce this full reversal of fentanyl-induced respiratory suppression. <clears throat> so this is really matching what we're seeing um, in the real world. So there are all these papers that have come out describing the need for higher doses of naloxone um, to reverse a fentanyl overdose. And we think that part of the reason that this is occurring is that fentanyl has this sort of unusual um, ability to produce um, muscle rigidity. So it's also called wooden chest syndrome, where the, the muscles around the, the diaphragm um, become really tight and immobile. And so that we're thinking that that is partly contributing to um, the inability of naloxone to reverse the overdose. And this is a um, mediated through non-opioid receptors. So it's a noradrenergic mediated response. So <clears throat> if you haven't seen this paper, I would really encourage you to read it because it's very, very well written. So what about some of the other medications for treating opioid use disorder like buprenorphine? Again, I want to go back to the animal literature because um, you know they they can do things with um, animal studies that we just can't really do very easily with people. But it um, it's a really good model for both rodents and primates um, to to study some of these effects and because they translate quite nicely to um, humans. So this was a study that. Um, my friend Alan Walker, who I went to graduate school with, and Alice Young um, at Wayne State University did a number of years ago. So this is that same um, warm water tail withdrawal procedure. They did it in rats instead of mice this time. Um, <clears throat> and they maintained uh, the rats on buprenorphine and tested the effects of a number of different mu agonists, including adenitazine, atorphine, which are both um, high efficacy, potent, mu opioid agonists, morphine was used as, as kind of a control. They tested the analgesic effects of buprenorphine itself, um, as well as GPA 1657, which is another partial agonist. So what I'll show you and what I want you to kind of pay attention to are these two doses, maintenance doses of buprenorphine. So the open circles are control and the upside down triangles is a, a dose of buprenorphine. So each of these panels is describing the effects um, of different of the different mu agonists. So adenitazine, atorphine, morphine, et cetera. <clears throat> so adenitazine produces a full analgesic response. With that dose, maintenance dose of buprenorphine, there's very little shift to the right in the dose response curve. With atorphine, you get a slightly um, bigger uh, rightward shift in the dose response curve. With morphine, you get a rightward shift that's starting to shift downward. With buprenorphine, that same dose of buprenorphine maintenance um, doesn't allow buprenorphine to produce a full analgesic response at all. Same with 1657. So basically what these data are telling us is that um, 
buprenorphine is not as effective in antagonizing the analgesic effects of the higher efficacy agonists. So imagine here that this is something like fentanyl, right? Um, where a, a maintenance dose of buprenorphine that would otherwise have produced, you know, effective blockade of, of heroin's effects, theoretically would not produce as much of a blockade as um, against a, a potent mu agonist like fentanyl. So I'm, I'm extrapolating here for sure, but um, you know, this is kind of the general principle that we've, um, that we've seen across a number of different assays. So what about self-administration? This was a study that um, Gail Winger and Jim Woods conducted uh, quite a while ago in rhesus monkeys who were trained to self-administer the opioids intravenously and they measured rates of responding. So they use morphine as their maintenance drug. Um, it would have been really nice if they had you know, tested buprenorphine or methadone, but they didn't. And the same kind of idea was, was applied here. So they tested um, a range of different mu agonists that are high efficacy, intermediate efficacy, or low efficacy. Um, and then they used cocaine as a control. So, <clears throat> They, they did a um, dose response curve for alfentanil prior to morphine um, maintenance. And you know the animals produced this dose related increase in rates of responding for alfentanil. And then they made the animal uh, physically dependent on morphine and tested alfentanil again. So there's really no change in the dose response curve. Same with cocaine. But when they looked at heroin and morphine as the test drug, so under um, prior to morphine uh, maintenance conditions, you know, heroin produces this dose-related increase in rates of responding for heroin. <clears throat> when they made them physically dependent, there's this rightward shift. And the same is true of morphine. When they tested nalbufene, Prior to morphine administration, they got this inverted U-shaped dose response curve, which is um, very typical of this assay. And when they made the animals um, dependent on morphine, they got these large rightward shifts in the dose response curve. And with buprenorphine, um, under non-dependent conditions, buprenorphine serves as a reinforcer, so they self-administer it. But when they're physically dependent on morphine, they don't self-administer any of the buprenorphine doses at all. So, and I've, I've shown the same kind of effect in <clears throat> studies in my lab. So the same principle um, holds true for a whole bunch of different kinds of um, procedures, drug discrimination, analgesia, um, self-administration and all different kinds of species. So this is a this is kind of a standard effect that if you um, it's it's harder to uh, block the effects of a high efficacy opioid compared to lower efficacy. So the question then really is how translatable these findings might be to humans. So <clears throat> As I mentioned, you know, I've, I did, I've done a bunch of different kinds of studies. So this is one I'll just show you where we maintained people on buprenorphine naloxone and looked at intranasal heroin administration. So the same kind of um, graph that I'm showing you, dose response curve, um, and these are in people, self-administering heroin. So under um, a low maintenance dose of buprenorphine, we got this dose-related increase in self-administration. With increasing doses of buprenorphine, we got these um, dose-related downward shifts in the dose response curve, which is great and what we wanted to see. Um, and this one is uh, under trough levels of buprenorphine. So we tested the effects of heroin about 14 hours after they had received their maintenance dose of buprenorphine. This is a study that I uh, completed a few years ago with Sharon Walsh, um, looking at hydromorphone. And this is a new uh, injectable formulation of buprenorphine. So um, prior to administration of, of buprenorphine, we did a 
um, hydromorphone dose response curve. And this is a measure of drug liking. So, you know, it's, it, it, as you would expect, there's a dose related increase in ratings of liking. When we gave the buprenorphine here, it completely eliminated responding um, uh, the drug liking response. And we gave the injection, a, a second injection a week later, and again, got full suppression of um, drug liking for hydromorphone. And we tested two different doses of this um, uh, sustained release form of buprenorphine. So that was really nice to see. Um, but what about fentanyl? Um, I don't know of any laboratory-based studies that have measured the ability of buprenorphine or methadone or naltrexone to antagonize the effects of fentanyl in humans. Um, <clears throat> you know, there are studies, uh, Mark Green Greenwald has done some studies, but it didn't exactly answer these questions uh, about how, how effective are these um, maintenance medications to block fentanyl's effects. So <clears throat> what about what about clinical treatment studies? There are even few, you know, uh, there aren't any, you know, prospective um, studies that I know of um, looking at this. There are a few retrospective um, studies that looked at treatment retention and, and abstinence at six months after initiation of buprenorphine. And they, they looked at patients who tested positive for fentanyl versus heroin at the beginning of buprenorphine treatment. So they, they, this paper uh, described the results showing that there's really no difference um, in treatment retention, but the sample sizes were pretty small. So the fentanyl positive group was uh, consisted of 48 patients and the um, heroin positive group consisted of 19 uh, patients. And, you know, this is only the, the, um, urine sample that was collected at the initiation of treatment. So it could be that, you know, patients um, as, as time went on were shifting to using um, fentanyl because it was getting increasingly adulterated into the opioid supply. So the study is not perfect, um, but it, they're showing that there's not really difference, uh, difference in the fentanyl versus positive versus negative group. There was another study that was published recently by Stone and colleagues um, showing that in, in methadone uh, maintained patients, treatment retention at 12 months didn't differ in people who um, were fentanyl positive versus negative. Um, and this sample size was a bit larger here. The fentanyl positive group was um, 121 and the fentanyl negative though was only 30. Um, <clears throat> So the conclusion I think from both of these two latter studies is that buprenorphine and methadone are effective um, in treating people who are using fentanyl. Um, what's really unclear uh, in both, or actually it's kind of clear, is that fentanyl positive urines were very common in both studies, but they do seem to be protective against um, fatal overdoses. So another clinical question that has really <clears throat> started to become clear is how, how to initiate patients onto buprenorphine treatment because withdrawal can be really severe in fentanyl users. So this is a study that um, Varshnia, um, this is a Hopkins group. So Kelly Dunn and Andrew Hewn are co-authors on this paper. I think Eric Strain is also a co-author. And what they're um, reporting is that <clears throat> the percentage of patients who are trying to transition onto buprenorphine um, reporting severe withdrawal is much higher um, for buprenorphine than, than patients trying to transition onto methadone. Um, <clears throat> and this is just showing you the time course. So if the, the buprenorphine or methadone were, tried, um, were initiated within 24 hours of the last dose of fentanyl, um, the percentage of patients reporting severe withdrawal is much higher with buprenorphine than, than methadone. And we're starting to see some papers um, describing how to induct people onto um, buprenorphine naloxone um, in fentanyl users. 
And I thought, I just found this paper yesterday. I thought it was interesting. Um, there's a, a plea from people who use drugs to clinicians um, asking for new ways to initiate buprenorphine. This was a really interesting study that I thought um, that was, was uh, reported last summer at, at um, CPDD and, and now is, is published in Drug and Alcohol Dependence. So what they are um, showing is the, the, the cumulative incidence of patients who are able to successfully transition over to um, a medication for treating opioid use disorder as a function of whether or not they're fentanyl negative or positive. So the fentanyl positive patients were half as likely to initiate treatment overall. So this is includes methadone, buprenorphine, and naltrexone. I think this effect is largely driven by the um, inability that these clinicians had to um, uh, transition patients onto naltrexone. So fentanyl positive um, patients were 11 times less likely to initiate treatment with naltrexone. Um, and in this study, they reported that, um, that there was no evidence that, uh, that fentanyl positive versus negative urines were related to buprenorphine initiation. So what can we conclude so far? One is that fentanyl is potent, has a rapid onset of action and it's short acting. Naltrexone is effective in preventing the fentanyl induced responses, but it seems to be less effective against carfentanyl um, based on the preclinical data. Naloxone also appears to be less effective against a fentanyl overdose um, based on both preclinical data and clinical case reports. So some of the unanswered questions are, how well do um, our uh, currently available treatment medications work against fentanyl? Um, the retrospective studies do suggest that buprenorphine and methadone are effective, but um, uh, ongoing fentanyl use seems to be pretty common. And we don't really know anything about the analogs. So there are a bunch of them that are kind of floating around out there. Carfentanil is the one that I'm most worried about. And now there are new, new uh, non-fentanyl analogs that are um, starting to emerge like the nitazine, so that's what they're called, it, and nitazine and all kinds of these other ones. So um, we also don't know how to most effectively transition patients from fentanyl to the treatment medications. And we don't know how to most effectively manage um, fentanyl related overdoses. So what do we do? At least in my world, we continue to develop medications and I'll just spend a couple of minutes talking about um, some of the work that I'm doing. So we are working with vaccines um, for uh, treating opioid use disorder. And the idea here is that we vaccinate um, patients with a, a vaccine that targets a specific opioid, they generate antibodies. Um, so when or if the patient uses the opioid again, um, the antibodies will bind to it and prevent it from getting into the brain. So we're working with three different um, uh, vaccines, one that targets oxycodone, hydrocodone, oxymorphone, another that targets heroin and morphine, and a third one that targets fentanyl and its analogs. So the idea that we have is that ultimately we'll have a multivalent vaccine that targets all of these medications or all of these drugs. These are just some data that were collected in rats showing that um, serum levels of fentanyl increase in vaccinated animals compared to controls and brain levels decrease. And in animals that are vaccinated, um, the respiratory depression is less with uh, when fentanyl is given. So one of the challenges, which we can talk about in a minute, is um, with vac the vaccine approach is that there can be kind of large uh, individual variability in the antibody production. 
So <laughs> there have been nicotine and cocaine vaccines that um, showed clinical proof of efficacy in about 30% of the patients who were immunized that showed the highest antibody levels. But overall, for both of these vaccine approaches, the um, phase three trials failed because um, the, the, you know, the average uh, treatment retention and, and primary effic efficacy endpoints were not reached. So <clears throat> we're trying to do some studies, which I think are really kind of cool, um, to identify biomarkers that might help us identify um, people who would be good responders. So this is, uh, you know, um, brain oxycodone levels in um, mice that were vaccinated. So oxycodone is, uh, the antibodies are effectively preventing the oxycodone from getting into the brain. Um, prior to vaccination, the ones that had the highest IgM B cell levels were the ones that showed um, the lowest brain levels of oxycodone. So this could potentially be used as a biomarker to identify um, patients prior to vaccination who would be good responders. So we basically would enrich the population so that only the, um, the patients who are most likely to uh, elicit a good antibody response would be enrolled. Um, <clears throat> We're doing this in our study, our ongoing study right now, um, where we're looking at oxycodone specific B cells. We're seeing that um, there's uh, significantly higher um, variability and um, levels of oxy specific B cells in our um, participants with opioid use disorder. Um, TNF alpha might be a, one of these biomarkers, um, and it seems to be correlated with the B cell response. So we're thinking that, that maybe the um, B cell activity could be used as a biomarker, but then also potentially TNF alpha as potentially a biomarker to predict vaccine efficacy. So that's it for now. Um, I'd like to thank my lab um, and thank you for your attention. Great. Thanks so much, Sandy, for that really in-depth and fascinating presentation. So it's open for questions. I'm looking. I don't see any questions at this point. Please don't be shy. Um, maybe I'll try and kick us off with one. Um, so I was wondering, Sandy, um, you know, with the different um, comparisons between methadone and buprenorphine, and both in terms of blocking effects of fentanyl, but also the potential challenges in transitioning from fentanyl. Um, if you or someone you were advising was seeking treatment for opioid use disorder, would those factors be enough to swing you towards buprenorphine or methadone as the treatment of choice? Um. <clears throat> Yeah, and we're actually starting to see, um, you know, because so we work primarily with non-treatment seekers, and a lot of times if they can't get their heroin or, or you know, opioid of choice, they'll use methadone or buprenorphine. Um, and I would say like five years ago, people were most often testing positive for buprenorphine, um, and now they're most often testing positive for methadone. Um, I think because of this, it's a lot easier for them. They don't experience this severe withdrawal. Um, mm -hmm. This is kind of a, a, a complicated cl clinical question though, because I mean, I showed you some um, papers describing how difficult it is to get um, patients on to buprenorphine. There are some clinicians who are reporting that there's, they have no problem. Um, the, one of the papers that I was describing actually said that they, they aggressively treat um, buprenorphine induced withdrawal and they don't have any trouble transitioning patients over to buprenorphine. Yeah. Um, so I think once, you know, getting a patient onto buprenorphine is hard, but it has the advantage of, um, of having like, you know, we have sublocate available now, right, for treatment and it's an injectable month long preparation. So in that regard, it's really nice for patients because then 
they don't have to make the decision every day of using, um, you know, whether or not to take their medication. Yeah. But methadone is easier to get them onto. So it's just kind of, I don't know, it's a tough question. Complex. Um, and I was thinking also, you know, we've invested so much in increasing the availability of treatment with buprenorphine, you know, because uh -huh. there's so many more regulations around methadone. So, uh, but fascinating information to think about. Uh, so we have other questions. Um, well, just, just to address oh, that please. point, yeah. super yeah. quick. Um, uh, so the public policy uh, forum at CPDD is um, targeted for, you know, the topic is um, the changing methadone regulations during the COVID pandemic. And there are lots of efforts underway to make um, some of those changes that were made permanent. Oh, wow. um, so, if you want to, <laughs> if you want to hear yeah. more about it, then definitely you know look that Terrific. up. Terrific, some upside to what we've been putting up with with COVID. Uh, keep yeah. some of it. Yeah. All right. So, a question: um, Would you mind clarifying what the vaccines would target? How they would be effective? Please. Sure. Sorry, I knew it was it was pretty brief at the end because uh, uh, the time was short. But so the idea um, with the vaccine, let's, we'll start with like a cocaine vaccine because it's a little bit easier to to kind of conceptualize at first. So there's a there's a haptin that's part of the vaccine that is what um, the body would generate antibodies to. So for cocaine, it's the cocaine structure, um, and it has all these other parts that are attached to the vaccine. But what happens is that the, the body generates these antibodies that recognize cocaine and binds it if somebody uses it. And then when it binds, it's this big kind of clunky um, structure that can't get into the brain. With cocaine and with nicotine, it's easy because it's just sort of like one substance that you're targeting. Opioids are a lot more complicated because um, the chemical structure of oxycodone is so different than morphine, which is again, really different than fentanyl. So you can't really have like one um, haptin that would produce, you know, like an antibody that targets all of them. So you have to have um, separate haptins um, that would you'd have to give together. Um, we actually, when we started this research, we just had the oxycodone and heroin vaccine and um, went in with our first uh, IND with the multi, you know, the bivalent vaccine, thinking, okay, if we cover, oxycodone and oxycodone, you know, like drugs like hydrocodone and oxymorphone. Um, and we had heroin and morphine, we cover most of the opioids and we'll just, you know, test this bivalent vaccine. The FDA though came back and said, no, 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 no. <laughs> we want you to test each of the vaccines separately before um, we would approve a, a multivalent vaccine. And so we had to go back to the drawing board and decided at that point um, to start with the oxycodone vaccine because the numbers wise, it was much, you know, the prevalence was much higher um, of uh, people using oxycodone than heroin. And then of course things changed and now we're starting to develop a fentanyl vaccine and all this kind of stuff. So, um, so that's kind of where we are right now. Beautiful. Um, another question, <clears throat> uh, what about the evidence on the relative uh, effectiveness of methadone versus buprenorphine in um, blocking analgesia or drug liking from fentanyl? There aren't any studies out there right now. Um, I've actually really thought about um, putting a grant in to study this because I think it's you know information that we desperately need. But I worry that, you know, Knight is just going to think it's too boring and, <laughs> and won't fund it. I, I don't know. Maybe I should just put one in anyways. Just, you know, but yeah, there, there aren't any studies that I'm aware of that did the direct comparison. Okay, another question. Uh, we know that cocaine is being laced with fentanyl. How do we study this in preclinical models? 
So I would point you in the direction of Charles France's work. I think he's doing some really excellent uh, work on this. Actually, um, Jack Bergman and his group, um, I think uh, uh, Barrow, um, I forgot her first name. She's, she's doing some stuff with drug combinations. Um, uh, I believe she's doing benzodiazepines in combination with uh, fentanyl. But um, Charles has also done drug combinations. And so um, they have, I, I'm happy to send you some papers um, so you can see how that's done. It is complicated um, to, to study drug combinations. Um, that, there's actually some work that uh, Richard Fulton and our group did as well, um, looking at speedballs. And I think Sharon Walsh has a couple of papers on this topic as well. Um, but it, it is tricky. Um, but I, I'm, again, you know, if you send me an email, I'm happy to send you some of those papers. Okay, um, a couple questions lined up. I'm short on time, so I'm gonna go rapid fire, but um, the your description of the volumes of fentanyl used by an individual was surprising given the potency. How does this relate to liking the drug? Are users seeking fentanyl or just using it um, by uh, accidentally because it's uh, mixed in or easier, cheaper? What are your what are your thoughts on on these volumes given potency? Um, I I guess I'm not hundred percent the the. The volumes are pretty low because I, I mean, at least in the studies that I've done, and I mean, they're on the order of like, you know, um, around a hundred, close to 200 micrograms, I yeah. guess, of 0.2 milligrams, which um, I think is pretty low. Is I, I, Maybe I'm missing the question. I think they may have meant um, the number of bags that people are using. Oh, 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 oh. yeah, yeah, yeah. So... Um, the reason for that, I think, is because um, the the as I showed in the um, one of the preclinical studies, the the duration of action of fentanyl in terms of its subjective responses is relatively short. I mean, you know, people report getting high, and then an hour later, it's gone. With heroin, people were very used to you know getting high, the effect lasts for a few hours, and then it's pretty much gone in like about five or six hours. So they didn't really have to um, use again right away. Um, with fentanyl, they, the, the high has gone so quickly that they're just using it repeatedly like that, you know, throughout the day. Um, so I think, I think that's the main reason that, that they're using more bags is because the effect is so, so short. Yeah, sounds spot on target. Um, last question, is the vaccine using a neutralization process in terms of how the antibodies work with the opioids or against the opioids? Um, so the, yes, the, once the um, antibodies bind the substance, um, because it can't get into the brain, it doesn't produce any of its normal physiological effects, um, maybe peripherally, no, even peripherally, because it, it's a, it's a complex. Um, so it doesn't really do anything until it, you know, until it passes out of the system, it just can't get into the brain. I mean, that's kind of the whole, uh, the whole concept in terms of how it works. All right, well, that wraps it up in terms of, of questions. And Sandy, I, I just want to thank you for this wonderful, informative talk on such a timely topic. I mean, these are questions that um, are impacting all of us scientifically and many of us just through neighbors and loved ones. And so it, it's really important stuff. Um, thanks for doing the work and thanks for taking time from your busy schedule to be with us today. Thanks You're to welcome. the audience for joining us and the wonderful questions. So um, that wraps it up for today. Bye-bye. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Bye. Bye.